Hey everybody, welcome back to another Tuesday's Tech Talk with me, Danny Ritchie. It's actually Friday for me, it's been a long day, it's been a long week. I've had a, a busy week with a lot to do, lots to work on, lots of speaker projects. Didn't even shave this morning, but I'm guessing you guys don't really care. You're just ready to dig into the technical discussion. If there's any girls out there watching, well girls just post in the comments section how good looking I am even when I don't shave and and then we'll know you're out there. So this week we're starting I guess a new series on crossover design and I wanted to start with the basics and went over the basics in my head quite a bit and thought before I even get to the basics I really need to lay a foundation you know before we even dive into the aspects and the orders and technical parts of crossover design let's talk about what we have to look at before we even start measuring and testing I mean right from the get-go what are the things we need to know and people send us stuff all the time uh, messages call me want me to design crossovers for different uh, applications they have different uh, projects they've come up with and they'll send me pictures of the drivers sometimes still small parameters and can you design a crossover for these yeah I can design a crossover for it well here are the parameters okay great send me the speaker uh, the parameters don't get the crossover designed you know the crossover is not designed based on electrical parameters I mean, if you just want me to make your amplifier happy, I can create something that's an easy load for your amplifier, but I'm guessing you probably want to listen to the speaker. And if you're wanting to listen to it, eh, I probably ought to take into consideration the acoustic output of all the drivers. And there's a lot of things that change um, the characteristics of a speaker and the output of each driver. And those things can be the width of the baffle, the length of the baffle, um, the distance that the drivers are from each other changes things, how far the voice coil of the drivers are inset. In this case, the front baffle is tilted slightly, so we're, we're dealing with the time alignment of the drivers that we're having to take into consideration. So all those things are things that we only know, we only see when the drivers are in the box that they're going to be in, and we're actually measuring the acoustic output of those drivers in that box and we can look at how how they uh, roll off into each other if there's a natural roll off that we can work with a whole lot of things that I will look for and try to look at how drivers naturally fall and naturally roll into each other you never go into it thinking I'm going to use this driver and this driver and I'm going to use a fourth order linkage rally crossover and I'm going to cross it at 300 Hertz and 3000 Hertz well, that's kind of like going and buying new tires for a car that you don't own yet and then going out and looking for a car that fits your tires. doesn't work that way. I mean, you have to look at what the drivers are asking for first. What do the slopes look like? Where is it naturally rolling off? Where is it extending to? Is there enough overlap of each driver? Um, the time arrival of everything, you just have to measure it and test it and go from there. Also you need to look at the drivers and you should of course look at that to begin with and uh, look at the materials that are used in the drivers. Look at the cones um, that are used. There's a lot of them out there using exotic materials, magnesium cones, aluminum cones, Kevlar cones, different poly cones and things like that. Uh, and Some of those materials are great if uh, you need bulletproof material but that's not really necessary if you're looking for sound quality. You're looking for other characteristics. Uh, I tend to prefer uh, paper-based drivers, um, drivers made from wood veneers, things like that that have natural damping qualities to them. They've, uh, they don't have a lot of breakup. They don't have a lot of ringing. When you have a driver, for instance, that's say a magnesium cone or an aluminum cone, You'll see at the top of its range, you'll see a rising response and you'll see some ringing, you'll see a peak. And what that means is you're going to have to put, or I'm going to have to put, a lot of crossover parts on there and a lot in the signal path to bring that down, to knock those peaks down, to get that ringing out of it, 
And higher order crossovers don't necessarily equal better quality sound. There's, you're not going to improve the sound by putting more and more parts on the signal path. Sometimes less really is more. And you don't want to have to add a bunch of notch filters and a bunch of things in there that are having to fix a lot of problems. You have to consider that stuff from the get-go. Even these drivers, uh, these are the new Elliptic-Core drivers. Um, it's a project that one of our customers sent us. We have customers sending this stuff all the time. This is one of the nicer designs that have come in. It was based on a kit that was designed by somebody over in Europe, um, offered over the internet. Um, my customer did a little twist on it. Uh, in the bottom, instead of uh, whatever it called for in the kit, he put one of our 12-inch servo subs and a servo amp right on the back of it. And he did use the crossover design that was designed for it. It was some type of a capacitorless design, and it was 20 or $30 worth of parts, uh, which is funny because uh, I think this woofer is over 800 8, 820 for the woofer. 700 just over 700 for this mid-range driver and that tweeter is uh, 370 dollars or something so nearly 1900 bucks just in these three drivers so for the pairs 3600 bucks or so just in drivers uh, plus shipping charges and then it came with a crossover that didn't really didn't really control the drivers didn't really allow them to operate effectively within the range that they're comfortable in. Uh, the customer said the best sounding part of the whole speaker was the bass. The servo subs were awesome. Uh, the bass was fantastic, but the rest of it was dark and lacked resolution and blah, blah, blah. And that's typical. Uh, the heart of the speaker is the crossover design. That's more important than, uh, than the drivers typically. Uh, you can take the best drivers out there, the most expensive drivers, like this for instance, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the greatest sound. As important or more important than anything is how well the crossover is designed and the quality of the parts in the crossover. I mean, there's budget level parts, there's high end parts, there's a lot of in betweens, and sometimes money's well spent is in the crossover especially when you've got drivers that don't require high order parts. Uh, if you've got a, a, a lot of these paper cone drivers like these have a nice smooth roll off. You're not having to correct for a lot of bringing and break up and crazy stuff going on. So you're not having to put a lot of parts in the signal path. You can afford to use good quality parts. That makes all the difference. Surprisingly with these drivers, as expensive as they are, uh, there are some issues with them. Uh, this little woofer here has four little resonance peaks. Uh, that you can see in the impedance curve. The, mi the mid has uh, one pretty significant little resonance peak at about 1300 hertz, which means that about 1500 hertz crossover point is about as far as you can let this thing play. It just is not going to play up above that very well. And if you do, you're going to contend with that little resonant bump there. You can see it in the factory impedance measurements. You can see it in there. Uh, frequency response measurement. You can see it in the spectral decay. I see it in my measurements and in exactly the same places in exactly the same way. It's there. And when you're designing a network, that's one of those things you have to consider. So fortunately, this tweeter, which was actually really good, had a uh, FS of about 400 and something hertz and a frequency response that played down to nearly 500. And so it was capable of crossing in the 1500 hertz range and that's what I wound up doing with these and then that little resonance issue wasn't a problem the resonance problems with this woofer was well out of the range that I used it I crossed it in the 160 to 180 range to this driver and uh, because it's a low crossover point you can use low order filters that helped a lot and uh, we're going to talk about that in the next segment about the orders of filters and, uh, but this thing wound up with a really smooth response. The vertical off-axis was still flat. Uh, the horizontal off-axis was really good. It's probably going to be a really good sounding pair of speakers when he gets it all assembled using good quality parts. And uh, with the servo sub in the bottom, this probably be a, a world-class speaker for, for a box speaker design. 
and it all centers around the crossover design. Like I said, it's the most important aspect of the speaker. And I know there's a lot of people out there that look at some of these drivers with uh, exotic materials and the ringing and the breakup, and they think, well, that's okay. I'm going to use a digital crossover to get all of that out of it. And you can. You can go in and digitally remove a lot of that, but there is no free lunch there. That comes with a whole new set of issues and problems. And there's a lot of those devices out there. And the ones that are in that budget price range are in the budget price range for a reason. They're a budget level piece of gear. The DA converter that's used in those, the analog output stage, the power supply that's used is, is noisy. All of those things are very budget, um, very budget priced and comparable to a CD player that you might buy for $49. That's the level of performance you're going to get out of some of those budget price digital filters. Now granted, a lot of them are really powerful. They'll allow you to do a lot of things and have a lot of functionality. But when you listen to them, the soundstage becomes very two-dimensional. They lack resolution. They're noisy. Uh, there's a lot there that's, uh, that's a problem. And I've, I've worked with a bunch of that stuff before. Um, I've had um, Rich Hollis bring over one of his, uh, you guys want to look him up, that's Hollis Audio Labs. He is the only one out there that I consider is a, a true high-end digital filter. That one was pretty good. And we did A-B comparisons with his crossover using um, basically mirroring, mirroring the same slopes that I did with the passive filter. And we were comparing the digital crossover versus the passive filter and his DAC used the same DAC chips as my DAC. Now the analog output stage was different in my DAC versus his. My DAC was running on batteries, his had a power supply. There was a lot of differences there, but basically the same DAC chip, a lot of the same circuitry. Um, the differences though were pretty astounding. Um, the high quality passive parts in the signal path made very little difference. I mean, when you get it at a really high level of quality there, you're not really looking at a lot of insertion losses, a lot of losses of clarity. It's not eating up power, things that you hear on the internet. That's not true. Uh, there was a lot more difference, though, between the digital filter and the passive filter in the actual DACs. The DACs and the output stages in the DACs were by far uh, a bigger difference than whether or not it had passive parts in the output or not, or passive parts on the, on the crossover. Um, it was just amazing how all the little things within the DAC and the way it's streamed made a bigger difference than all of us really thought. Um, I preferred my DAC in the passive crossover uh, over his, and it was it was it was still close. His was very good, and what's impressive is none of the other digital filters that I've I've done anything with have even been in the ballpark. His was really close and his allowed for a greater dis, uh, degree of adjustment within the phase control and allowed the drivers to be time aligned just completely perfect. Um, so his allowed the sound stage to be a little bigger uh, but it lost a little resolution to uh, the DAC I was using. But since then he's upgraded to another level of DAC uh, and several other things uh, that he claims is even better. So if you're, if you're really looking to do that, if you're doing a DIY project and you just want to go digital only, call Rich Hollis. Uh, Rich will help you out and give you some guidance and put you in a good direction. I also have a lot of people that will say, hey, I'll just use an electronic crossover. Uh, no. No, that's not going to get you in the same ballpark as some of the higher end uh, passive devices, higher, end, higher quality passive filters. It's just not. Um, those electronic crossovers put a lot of op amps in the signal path. They've got AC noise so you're going to have to deal with. Again, they've got a whole new set of problems that you've got to deal with, and they're only textbook slopes. So what they're doing is they're allowing for the adjustment of the slopes, but they're not allowing for the adjustment of the drivers within their pass band, which is what is taking place when I design a passive filter. This driver, for instance, had a rising response. So the filter had to take that into consideration, not just creating a, a left and right on the crossover function. 
It's not just creating a filter only, you know, a first and a second order or a fourth order filter at a given frequency. You have to take into account that it's rising within its band. The tweeter was the opposite. The tweeter was was higher in the top end and it drops off more and levels out at the lower end. So you're kind of dealing with three or four dB change within the tweeter's response that you have to take into account with the filter. And you can do that passively with the design. You can't really do that with the electronic crossover. So there's a lot of advantages when you're looking at the elite speakers, the top level, what's the best of the best speakers out there. You're, they're, they're still using passive filters. And um, there's your guys who love vinyl and they love their analog rigs and there's no way they're gonna consider running their signal through an A to D converter and a D to A converter. Uh, just That's just not gonna happen. Uh, the purest of the purest, the top of the top, it's still using passive filters. And yes, we can design them for you. You're going to have to do the same thing this guy did. Ship me this 200 and something pound speaker. Fortunately, it's a little lighter. I had him take the servo sub and the amp off, so it was probably 180 pounds. And um, it was a lot to ship it to me. But when you consider the level that he's wanting to play, it's worth it to have a real crossover designed. Uh, even if you have a little mini monitor, even at lower price points, it doesn't cost that much to ship me a mini monitor. I can set that thing up and take measurements on it and design something pretty easily, box it up and ship it back to you. That's easy to do. And we do that all the time. I've got a line of them over here of speakers that are ready and waiting for me to set them up and start measuring and testing. So um, those are some of the basics. That's stuff that we think of and look at before we start building the crossover. Next week, next episode, hopefully we dig into this a little deeper. We start looking at what is a first order filter? What is a second order filter? What does it mean? Um, are they first order electrical or first order acoustical or second order electrical and second order acoustical? And does an electrical slope mean it's going to have the same acoustic slope? Hmm, because you can get an acoustic slope that's different from the electrical slope and vice versa. And we're going to talk about that stuff and try to put some of the basics on here. Tune in next week. If you have questions, again, put them in the comment section. I love seeing all those people following along and asking questions and, and uh, thanking me for what I do. Thank you for thanking me. Um, that's it for this week, and tune in again next week. Have a good one.